I'm going to read a few verses of Scripture from uh, the book of Leviticus, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, okay? <laughs> Leviticus, and God is talking to His people Israel. He has a great plan and a great purpose for them. They are going to be a nation that's going to reveal the glory of God to all the other nations of the world. In the beginning, He chose Adam and Eve, and Adam and Eve failed. And then because of that, God then chose a nation, the, the people of Israel. And right here in the beginning, He begins to give them the Ten Commandments. He gives them a law because He knows what's in their hearts. He knows that these people need guidance. They need direction. They need boundaries. And so he lays out a number of laws and commandments to them. In Leviticus 26, he tells them certain things. And he says, if you are obedient, you will receive these blessings. God's blessings will be given to them if they obey his word. Later on in the chapter, he says, if you are disobedient, these are the things I will punish you with. And he lays it out, and I'm going to read just a few. It says in verse 23, and if you fail to learn a lesson from this and continue your hostility towards me, then I myself will be hostile toward you. And I will personally strike you seven times over for your sins. And I will send enemies against you to carry out these covenant threats. If you flee to your cities, I will send the plague to destroy you there. And you will be conquered by your enemies. I will completely destroy your food supply. So the bread from one oven will have to be stretched to feed 10 families. They will ration your food by weight. And even if you have food to eat, you will not be satisfied. If after this you still refuse to listen and still remain hostile towards me, then I will give full vent to my hostility. I will punish you seven times over for your sins. You will eat the flesh of your own sons and daughters. I will destroy your pagan shrines and cut down your incense altars. I will leave your corpses piled up beside your lifeless idols. And I will despise you. I will make your cities desolate and destroy your place of worship. And I will take no pleasure in your offerings of incense. Yes, I myself will devastate your land. Your enemies will come to occupy, will be utterly shocked at the destruction they see. Right over there, God is talking to them and is giving them a very clear warning concerning their obedience or disobedience. Later on, we go to 2 Kings chapter 7. And there's something strange happens, actually partly a fulfillment of what God has just spoken in Leviticus. It says that Samaria was surrounded by the Assyrians. And they were starving. There was no food. They were in a terrible condition. They couldn't go out. No one could come in. And so here they're living in this city that they had built where they had been blessed. And now because of their disobedience and disobeying God, God has shut off the food supply. And they're in that city starving and dying, the enemy round about them. And while the king is walking on the wall of the city, a woman comes running to him and says, please help me. The king looks at her and says, what do you want me to help you with? I cannot give you wine and food because there is none. And the most amazing thing is that this woman says to the king, 
We're starving. And I made an agreement with another woman that one day we'll eat her son and then the following day will we eat my son. And so the day came, we ate my son, and when the day came to eat her son, we couldn't find her son. She hid him. You see what God has said in the book of Leviticus has now come to pass in the book of Kings. These people were so arrogant. They had no respect for the law of God. They were disobedient to God that they got into such a sinful condition that they were willing to eat one another. The king, the Bible says, was shocked. And he strips off his robes. And they see that the king is dressed in sackcloth. Now you must know that the clothes that a king wore was made out of the best linen. Very expensive. He was probably the best dressed person in all the kingdom. But he tears that off and underneath that he's wearing sackcloth. Clothes made out of sack, coarse. The people wore those sackcloths because they were either repenting or self-humiliation uh, or they were in deep sorrow and brokenness. And so they were shocked to see even the king was in that condition. And I think there's a very important lesson that we can learn right there. Because many times we look at other people and we look at their successes and we see how beautifully they are dressed and all their possession and the material things that they possess and we think, oh, they have life so easy and yet we are struggling and toiling every day. We possess nothing. We're getting nowhere. And there begins a jealousy and envy in our hearts. Isn't that so true? And yet, we don't know what's going on in their lives. We don't really understand what they're going through. Even with the richest man in the world, we don't know. We think everybody, because they've got all that stuff, that life is easy, and they're having a wonderful life, and here we are toiling every single day. And that's what these people thought. King walking on the, on the walls of the city, dressed in his fine linen. And yet when he hears this terrible thing taking place, he tears off that clothes and there they see even the king. In his position, in his place of power, has his own issues and his own problems. And that he is also going through suffering. You see, this is a very difficult passage of Scripture when it speaks about this woman, them eating their child. But they were desperate. Uh, there was no food whatsoever. And the, the passage of Scripture goes on and it says, now there were, that's all it says, now there were four lepers in Samaria. It is amazing how God works. It never ceases to be amaze me. So there are many stories in the Bible I love and I preach them over and over again because they are so full of miracles. The, 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 the very evidence of the things that God uses for His glory baffles those who think that He's always looking for the elite and the best. But He's the God of the ordinary people. And yeah, there are four men sitting at the gate of the city. All the people in the city are starving. There's no food. They turn to cannibalism. And outside the enemy is camped waiting for them to die so they can take over the city. But here at the gate, there are four lepers. Now we don't hear much about leprosy today. But leprosy was a terrible, terrible disease. It was a terrible condition. Uh... Leprosy, there, there were several things about leprosy, and that is that leprosy was incurable. Lep leprosy, there was no cure for leprosy. In fact, what they used to do, they used to separate the lepers from the other people. 
So leprosy also separated people, separated a man or a woman from their family, separated them from their nation, that they had to go live isolated from everyone else because of this dreadful thing called leprosy. Leprosy ate your body. Some of the lepers had hands missing, arms missing, legs missing, ears missing, nose missing, different parts of the body. When, it, when it's eaten up by leprosy, it just falls away. They were to be far away from other people because it was contagious. They could pass it on to other people. And the final thing about leprosy, it led to death. I've been, I've been in the valley of lepers in the kingdom of Lesotho many, many, many years ago when I went to preach through, through that country, Lesotho. Right up there in the mountains, in the valley of, of the, some of those mountains up there, they had a leper colony. But people were outcast. They had to live there and die there. And it's unbelievable what you see. That was the condition here. Now, the amazing thing about leprosy, even though I said it's a disease, is the fact when you go to the New Testament, Jesus never heals a leper. Never. He cleanses a leper. Read it for yourself. It says Jesus cleanses the leper. We sing songs. Uh, the man of Galilee that cleans the lepers. You see why? And I think it's because leprosy is a type of sin. Leprosy is incurable. They could do nothing to heal people. And even today, sin cannot be healed. You can go to the psychiatrist, you can go to the psychologist, you can go to the doctor, you can go to the counselor, you can go wherever you want to. But there's no medicine for sin. God made sure that there's only one remedy, and that remedy is the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. And the church needs to stand on these truths. No matter what happens in the world, what, no matter what happens in society, we need to build our lives on the solid truth of God's Word. Amen. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but the Word of the Lord shall endure forever. Sin is contagious. We've inherited Adam's sinful nature. We pass it on. Sin separates. Separates husbands and wives, parents and children. Nation from nation, color from color, sin separates. Isn't it amazing that, that sin is like leprosy and the, and, and, and the final analysis of sin, it, it, it brings forth death. The wages of sin is death. The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And so here were these lepers in this terrible condition. And, and you, might, you might be shocked by it, but you know what? There, there are work, people in a worse condition than these lepers. Those people are in a condition of sin. Somehow the church does not grasp the terrible consequences of sin. How sin destroys. How sin robs a man and a woman of peace and joy and hope. And in the midst of all the suffering, in the midst of this valley of lepers, well, I'm speaking about sinners, uh, many times we are preaching nonsense from the pulpits. Tickling people's ears, playing games. When multitudes and multitudes of people are in the valley of despair, dying because of sin. Four lepers. Not only that, they were in pain. Why do I say what I'm saying this morning? Because you and I know that when you watch television or you live and listen to the politician or the justice system or the education system, they blame everything else on earth except where the blame belongs. The heart of man is deceitful and desperately wicked. Who can know it? 
out of the heart of man proceed evil thoughts, fornication, murders, lies, and adultery. You'll only stop racism when men and women are born again of the Spirit of God. You'll only stop stealing and hatred and jealousy and murder and rape and incest and all the things that you see when the heart of man is changed by the power of God. There were four lepers. People in the city were trapped. They were stuck. Many people are sitting in that position this morning, hopeless. These poor four lepers, they're sitting there at the gate. Struggling with this leprosy. They can't go in because they're not allowed to. They'll get killed. And they ain't going to get no food there because there is no food. They can't go out because the enemy will kill them as well. They're sitting in a hopeless position right over there. This is their lot in life, it seems to be. And that's what many people see. Many people find themselves in a position of hopelessness or despair or some experience in life has pulled you down and now you're saying to yourself, this is my lot in life. This is perhaps where I need to be. This is a cross that I may need to bear. A sense of hopelessness. But these four lepers said, why should we here and die? They came to themselves. If you're in that condition this morning, you don't even have to come to yourself. You just have to allow the Spirit of God to convict you, to convince you. He will help you out of that hopelessness and that helplessness. Why should we? Uh, if we go back into the city, then we'll die. There's no food. If we go out, maybe, maybe the enemy will have mercy on us. That, that, that is a little bit of faith. It, 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 is, it, it shows a little bit of faith in, in the hearts of these lepers. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. They did not see what was ahead. But they rose. They stood up. A lot of people talk faith. But there's no action. Faith without works is dead. We can't say we believe things and we believe things and we don't stand up. And do. Faith is active and faith when it's active brings forth revelation. What was the Revelation. They saw a defeated army. And the most amazing thing when you read the, the story is that these four lepers, when they stood up and they said, we're going to go into the enemy's camp. God began to move. You see, the hand of God moves when we move in faith. And the moment they stood up to go, God made it as if it was a mighty army behind them. There, there were sounds of horses and there was, there was a sound of, 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 of armor, uh, like a great mighty army was coming down upon the Assyrians. Meantime, it was only four lepers, tattered clothes, lost limbs, brokenness, dying. And that whole army fled. They were defeated. The enemy was defeated. Speaks to us about the enemy being defeated at the cross. The cross of Jesus. He never only died for our sins, but he also defeated the devil. He made an open shame of him. It says in the book of Revelation, it says, I'm he that liveth and was dead. Behold, I'm alive forevermore, and I have the keys of hell and death. Now, after his resurrection, he has the keys of hell and death. Who had them before? Satan. Satan is the author of death. He had the keys. But Jesus strips him of that power and that authority. 
that he no longer has the power of death. All he can do is deceive and lie and cheat. God said he's a liar and a thief and a robber has come to destroy and to kill and to murder. But Jesus has defeated him. Don't let a defeated enemy pull you down. Don't let a defeated enemy rob you of the blessing and the joy that God has prepared for you. Don't let him keep you in bondage. Don't let this defeated enemy hold you in prison because God's plan and purpose for you is to be free. Free. He who the sun sets free is free indeed. They walk towards the enemy's camp and the enemy hears this and they say, oh, uh, the king must have got a mighty army to come and help him to kill us. And so they ran for their lives. And the four lepers walk into their camp and there's all the gold and the silver and the food and the clothes and the horses and the donkeys and the chickens. They left everything behind and ran for their lives. Hey, man, if God is for us, who can be against us? Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. In his right hand are pleasures forevermore. God has blessings for us. And when I thought about it, I thought about in Ephesians when he says we have been blessed. You, you see, some of us, maybe not in this church, other churches, some of us are always looking for a blessing. We're looking for a blessing. We, some people even run to where they think a blessing is. Do you know how contrary that is to Scripture? In Ephesians, he says, we are blessed Amen. with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. I don't know if you caught that. He said, we are blessed with spiritual blessings in heavenly places. He never said you're blessed because you got a Mercedes. He never said you're blessed because you got a mansion and because you got a big bank account. He's not saying that. He's saying spiritual blessings. And I'm going to name a few. I won't preach on them. I'll just name a few great blessings. First blessing we receive is the blessing of forgiveness. Yeah. Forgiveness. He not only forgives us, but He washes us clean, whiter than snow. Hallelujah. Far as the east is from the west, He has removed our transgressions from us. We are a forgiven people. Yeah. We didn't do anything about it. It's a blessing. We are cleansed. We are justified. Yeah. Do you know what that great doctrine of justification means? That's what Martin Luther uh, broke away from Catholicism because he realized about justification by faith. But you know what justification simply means? It just means that me who was a sinner can stand in the presence of a holy God just as if I have never sinned. He has cleansed me and clothed me in His righteousness. Wow, what a blessing that I stand before my heavenly Father this morning with all my faults and my failures and my mistakes, but I'm clothed in the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Amen. Justified. I'm righteous. I'm sanctified. Set apart. I can hear the testimony. Set apart for God's use. I was, I was used by the devil. He not only used me, he abused me. You talk about abuse. I, so many nights I, I, I was scared I was dying because of my lifestyle. He made me suffer and I paid for it. Paid out of my own pocket. <laughs> but Jesus, when I came to Jesus, he sanctified me. He set me past from a carnal use to a spiritual use. Hallelujah. I'm glorified. We're going to be glorified when He comes. Be like Him. And He's still going to bless us with the rewards. We are blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. He brought those four lepers from absolute poverty 
into tremendous blessing. In fact, when they went back and they, they told the people about the camp and this, you can go and help yourself because they said to themselves, it's not right that we keep this to ourselves. We need to share. You, you see the, the, the amazing principles here in this Old Testament story. It, it, it's just simply a reminder of the Great Commission. You've been saved. You've been blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Now why are you keeping it for yourself? Why, 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 why are we keeping quiet? We do not well. We're not doing well by keeping this uh, to ourselves. We, we, we've experienced all this from God. He's cleansed us and blessed us in this wonderful way. But now we need to go and share with others the great blessings that God has given us. This is the day that people need to hear good news. No, not one amen in this house this morning. Amen. This is the day that people need to hear good news. Amen. If you put on the news, it's bad news all the time. Bad news on the left, bad news on the right, bad news on the center, bad news on the hill, bad news in the valley. Bad, bad, bad news. But in the midst of it, there's good news. Amen. And God is here with all his power to redeem men and women from their sin. In my father's house so many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you so. But I'm going to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I'm coming back again. Hallelujah. He's faithful to every promise he makes. Good news. You don't have to go to bed at night with 10 tablets. You don't have to wake up in the morning with another 10. There's peace. In the valley, from the Prince of Peace, God gives us peace. And the first peace we all need is peace with God. Because we've accused Him. We've blasphemed Him. We've turned our backs on Him. We've broken His word. We've been disloyal and disobedient. But He's willing to forgive us. We've done all those things. But he's changed us. And so the scouts, they go out and they see. The king sends out scouts to go and check if these guys were telling the truth. When they get there, it was absolutely true. The enemy had left and fled and left everything there. And so they came and they plundered that place. One of the things that we must point out that right when I read Leviticus, and you see it happen in Kings. God is faithful to his word. Whatever God says will come to pass. You can build your life, your marriage, everything on his truth. His truth is unshakable, unmovable. And he's faithful to it. And so God brought a mighty deliverance there. A mighty deliverance. What else does it bring to us, just quickly because I'm going to close, is that God, my favorite verse, uses the foolish things of the world. Who would ever have done that? If it was our government, they would have had a new department. And that new department would have had another six new departments. Now how to solve this problem, and when they've had all those departments come together, they will still be at the loss. What would I have done? But God chooses four rejected men, or women, whatever they were, men, whose lives were a disaster, a disaster. And he uses those broken men who were busy falling apart, dying, to save a city. Four. No computers. No technology. 
just used by God. Pliable in the hand of God. And like Kofi testified this morning, you can't say, I've got nothing. I can't say, I've got nothing. I'm not ashamed of what I am. You know why I'm not ashamed? Because this is what God made me. You see? So I don't hide all my things in the, and come and stand there, talk like a man that's got 10, 15 degrees. You know? Some people can do that. It's fine. I've got no problem. I'm, I'm happy for them. I don't have to put a collar to show you I'm a minister. I don't have to come out from the dark at the back here because I'm the important guy here this morning. I don't have to do that. And if I say something you don't like, so what? I am who God made me. And as, as some people, I'm comfortable in my skin. I'm surprised not only at the miracles that God has performed and what you read throughout scriptures, but I'm surprised that he chose me. I rebelled against him. I swore. I cursed his name. I lived an immoral life. Drunkard. In the gutter. In the streets. Fighting. Doing all kinds of terrible things. And this God who spoke this universe into existence and keeps it together by the power of his word. Didn't bypass me for the elite. Didn't bypass me for those who got hundreds of degrees. He picked me up in the gutter. And he changed my life. And he said, you're not going to sit here. You're going to go. And I went. And with all that I am and all that I've been, I stand here this morning with the knowledge and insurance that I've been a witness to many, many thousands of people through many years. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He uses the weak, the broken and despised things of the world to confound the wise. Why? Maybe you say, why does God use you? Why does God use broken things? Why did he use a, a sling? Why did he use a cross? Why did he use the, a blowing of a trumpet and a shout to make walls come down? So that no flesh may glory in his presence. You see, if I'm here this morning and I've got degrees coming out of my ears and I can speak the most beautiful English you've ever heard, I may just, maybe just, <laughs> think it's because of me. But I know, you don't have to tell me. <laughs> you know what, I'm going to close now. <laughs> you know, I sat under my brother-in-law. My brother-in-law uh, was an alcoholic, terrible drunkard. My sister went through hell, really hell, with him. He got saved. Miraculous salvation. Very, very clever man. And uh, I, they took me when I was a young boy. My parents couldn't look after me anymore. My dad had lost everything, and I grew up with their kids. And uh, he taught me a lot of stuff. And I used to look at this man, and I used to see things there that, I, that is unbelievable. I was working for him, and he said to me one, day, one morning, he said, uh, Tom, this new guy we got here is a big problem. I'm going up to my office, and I'm going to pray. Ask God to take him out. <laughs> <laughs> the next morning, the guy comes in and resigns. Out of his own. When there was no business, he gave money away. He didn't care what people think. You know, they used to wear safari shoes. I don't know who wears them today, but it's a, it's a jacket with it's a shirt a car, uh, with pockets and, and a pants. And he used to wear the pants down here, the short pants. And then he used to wear brown shoes with a blue khaki suit. And he's got little brown socks just sticking out above his shoes. Unbelievable. <laughs> but I tell you, when he walked in the bank, they all stood to attention. And I've seen that man preach. In fact, he, he built the gospel driving, the first in the world. And I, 
I've gone driving for 12 years. My wife and I went every Saturday night. That's why I don't watch much movies anymore. I had 12 years of movies every Saturday night. He built that gospel driving out of his own pocket. People would come Saturday night, hundreds of cars, and they wouldn't pay. It's all free. He paid for it, but they got to listen to his preaching. And he won many, many people into the kingdom of God. Folk, you've got to be honest before God who you are. Don't try and bluff other people. They don't deserve you to bluff them. Just be who you are. God can take any one of us and perform a miracle. You don't have to go to the television to listen to the guy who's selling you anointed oil and stuff. All that nonsense. He's given the power to the church, the people, the people. The church is for the people. The pastors are for the people, not the people for the pastors. They are here to equip God's people to do the work of the ministry. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. So God uses four lepers to save a city. Surrender your life to him. Heal to him. Don't look at others. Envy what they've got. Don't do that. Just say, here I am, Lord. Like we had the testimony this morning. God can use you. Listen. I'm closing for the third time. <laughs> All around us is a mission field. You don't have to go to South Africa. You don't have to go to China. They're all here. This is the mission field right here. Every single day. We've got to get beyond this thing that church is a place I go to, listen to message, sing a song, give my tithe. Some, uh, and, and that's the end of it. No. We've got to live this. We've got to live our changed lives. Why sit we here? We do not well. How can we sit here when we starved? We were starved and we were, we were dying and we had nothing. Now we've got everything in abundance. We cannot keep it for ourselves. We must go and share. I'm going to ask you to stand this morning. I cut the message short this morning because I don't know whether I was going west or east. But this I do know. Some of you today are going to surrender your life to the Lord. Today, you're going to say, you know what? I'm not going to sit anymore. I'm going to say, here I am, God. Take me, do with me whatever you want to do. And when God takes your life and he puts you in a certain position, don't complain. That might just be the starting point. I don't know if you know, and, and I just want to say this. Many years ago, I had an old man here preaching from England. He was a pastor. He was the pastor of one of the large churches in London. And I was talking to him one day. We were driving a car and he said, you know, I'm stepping out of my ministry at the church. And all my board and my people came and told me, this guy, this guy, and this guy. But you know who I made the pastor when I left? He said, the janitor. He took the janitor, the man who was cleaning the church, and made him the pastor of that big church. He said that man had the heart, he, he was a servant, and he was open to whatever God wanted to do in him and through him. That man today is still the pastor of that big church, world-renowned church. He was a janitor. So don't underestimate what God can do for you, what God can do for me. Hallelujah. Just close your eyes for a moment. The first thing that's important to all of us is that we experience the forgiveness of sin. God loves us and he wants us to be forgiven and cleansed, to become a new creature, a fresh hope in this life. If there's someone here this morning, you've never made a decision. Maybe you've been sitting in church for a long time, but you've never really said, Jesus, here I am. Will you do that this morning? Why don't you just raise your hand? I can see that you have that desire and I'm going to pray with you. Is there someone? Is there someone this morning? 
Maybe you're here and you felt that God will never use you. You don't have much. You know, God takes the little and He makes much out of it. But today you say, you're going to say, yet I am, Lord. I want you to raise your hand to and say, Lord, yet I am. Thank you. Whatever you want to do in me and through me, yet I am. I'm surprised there's only a few people that are putting up their hands. All of us should put up our hands this morning and say, Lord, yeah, we are. We can't just sit here. This is the day of glad tidings. This is the day of good news. This is the day that you will empower us and cause us to do mighty things in your name, in your workplace, at home, wherever you go. God wants to use you. And when you get to heaven one day, there's going to be some people that will be there. They'll be there primarily because of Jesus' death on the cross, but they'll be there because of your witness and your testimony. And I'm saying even to myself this morning, Lord, help me. I can't just sit here. You've got to use me. You've got to give me the courage and the boldness to share what you've done for me. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you. Father, we pray for every person here this morning that you'll help us in this day and age to be witnesses of your grace and your love. You have blessed us. We, we, we come in blessing, we go out blessed. And so, Lord, help us that we will not be ashamed of the gospel, that we will not be afraid to be different because you have made us different. And so, Father, I pray that your blessing will be upon your people, and that each person will have an opportunity somewhere, sometime, to take someone else to heaven with them. We ask these things in the name of Jesus. We are standing up and we're saying to you, Lord, here we are. Take us. Use us for your glory. Amen. Amen. God bless you.